You're walking along the street Or you're at a party Or else you're alone And then you suddenly dig You're looking in someone's eyes You suddenly realize That this could be the start of something big Hey, 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 Kim here. Over the last few installments, I've been diving into the network primetime lineup of fall 1965. Over two nights, we've seen drastically different pictures presented with strong and ultimately classic lineups all around. While Monday nights showed a lineup largely built around one network, Tuesdays were a little more fun with memorable shows spread out over the entire night. So let's continue with this examination of 1965 and television. We're turning our attention to Wednesday. Diving right on in for the night, as a classic TV fan, everything feels immediately familiar. CBS opened the night with the debut of the, now legendary, family drama Lost in Space. The show followed the Robinson family, a group of space colonists fleeing problems on Earth in 1997 when they become Lost in Space. The series starred Guy Williams, June Lockhart, Angela Cartwright, Bill Mummy, Marta Kristen, Mark Goddard, and Jonathan Harris. The series is still very much known in popular culture, having had a feature film remake as well as a Netflix remake over the last two decades. It would continue to run on the network for three seasons. Meanwhile, ABC brought the final season of the ultra-long-running situation comedy The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. The series had been a tough and lingering part of the network since 1952 and starred Ozzy and Harriet Nelson, as well as their sons Ricky and David, who grew up on the small screen in front of the American public. The series was a domestic comedy following the real-life family as they dealt with relatively real-world problems, except that Ricky Nelson really never was an awkward teenager. I'm a traveling man. The series would remain in the time slot until mid-season when it would move to Saturdays to round out its run. The network neatly slid the debut season of Batman into Wednesday nights beginning in January of 1966. The now legendary series would go on to run three years. Meanwhile, NBC were the outliers in the time slot presenting the fourth season of The Virginian. The James Drury-led series is well known as one of the longest-running westerns on television, just behind the granddaddy of them all, Gunsmoke and Bonanza. At this point, The Virginian was smack dab in the middle of its run and would go on to run nine seasons on the network. While The Virginian continued on NBC and CBS played the second half hour of Lost in Space, ABC had a clear path to run with what would be the final season of The Patty Duke Show. The series followed identical cousins, Patty and Kathy Lane, played by Patty Duke in dual roles as they negotiated the trials and tribulations of living as teenagers in Brooklyn Heights. Meet Kathy, most everywhere, from Zanzibar to Barclay Square. But Patty's only seen the sights a girl can see from Brooklyn Heights. What a crazy pair. But they're cousins. Identical cousins all the way. One pair of matching bookends. Different as night and day. The series also starred Gene Byron, William Schallert, Eddie Applegate, and Paul O'Keefe. The season was a big transitional one for the show. Patty Duke had turned 18 as the season started, and the creative team was released from the constraints of having a minor in their leading role. As a result, the show relocated to Los Angeles. And while the general plot remained much the same, there were some definite stylistic and mild thematic changes this season. Over on NBC, the Virginian was still finishing up, so ABC filled this half hour with a head to head matchup that's just painful to read about. CBS ran with the fourth season of the Beverly Hillbillies. The comedy is one of those we still remember today, thanks to years of strong syndication airings of its nine seasons. The series starred Buddy Epson, Irene Ryan, Donna Douglas, and Max Bear Jr. as a family who, heck, I'll just let the theme song tell it. Come and listen to a story about a man named Chad. A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food. And up to the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is. Black gold. Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kin folks said, Jed, move away from there. Said, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. 
Hills, that is. Swimming pools, movie stars. The Beverly Hillbillies. Considering the Beverly Hillbillies was the Beverly Hillbillies, ABC's decision to run the debut season of Gidget against the comedy titan is just sad. The series was based on the already well-trod story of Gidget, a teenage girl surfer. By this point, the Frederick Conner novel had previously been adapted into three feature films. The half-hour situation comedy starred Sally Field as the titular character and Don Porter as her father. There was a definite trend this year of women, more specifically young women, top-lining shows. Perhaps Gidget's relatively tired subject matter can be blamed on the short single-season run, but it definitely had its work cut out for it against the Beverly Hillbillies. Gidget was moved out of the time slot at mid-season and replaced by a show called Blue Light. Unfortunately, this one didn't fare any better than Gidget in the time slot. The World War II spy thriller starred Robert Goulet and Christine Carrere and followed an American double agent in Nazi Germany during the Second World War. The series' half-hour format is an interesting one considering the subject matter, and audiences clearly weren't there for the show. It was canceled after a half-season. As the clock turned to the next hour, the networks presented three brand new shows. Over on NBC, they aired Bob Hope Presents the Chrysler Theater. The series was a recurring presence on the network as far back as 1963. The anthology show often featured star-studded casts and narratives introduced by Hope, who was a comedy legend by this point in his career. The show would go on to run on NBC another two years. Over on ABC, they changed up the pace with the debut season of Western The Big Valley. The show followed the Barkley family in post-Civil War California and starred Barbara Stanwyck, Richard Long, Peter Breck, Lee Majors, and Linda Evans. The show would run four more seasons on the network. Meanwhile, CBS ran another finely remembered sitcom, which has spanned the test of time. Once again, I'll let the theme song speak for itself. Green Acres is the place to be is the life for me land spreading out so far and wide keep manhattan just give me that countryside no york is where i'd rather stay i got allergic smelling hay i just adore a penthouse view darling i love you but give me park avenue the chores. The stores. Fresh air. Times Square. You are my wife. Goodbye, city life. Green Acres, we are there. Green Acres starred Eddie Albert and Ava Gabor as a couple who renounce their wealthy city life for a simple existence in Hooterville. While 1965 was only its debut season, the popular comedy would go on to run six seasons and very much survive into DVD releases and syndication. As 9.30 rolled around, Bob Hope and the Big Valley were wrapping up their second half hours, leaving CBS the only network offering new content. And with that being said, it was definitely a biggie. The Dick Van Dyke Show was going into its final season in 1965. The show had been a big part of the CBS lineup since its premiere in 1961, and not only been a solid ratings performer, but also received a large amount of critical and awards praise. While there have been a number of shows we've talked about as surviving the passage of time, The Dick Van Dyke Show is one which runs alongside I Love Lucy and The Honeymooners as true icons of television. The night came to a close with a crowded but almost lackluster lineup, though this does potentially make sense given how packed the earlier part of the night was. NBC started with what is probably the best remembered of the block with the debut of spy drama, I Spy. Younger viewers will potentially be familiar with this name thanks to its 2002 feature film remake starring Eddie Murphy and Owen Wilson. The series starred Robert Culp and Bill Cosby in a role that very much propelled him into the mainstream. The show, which followed the leans traveling the world as an undercover tennis pro and his coach, is one of the earliest examples of a black actor leading a Hollywood television series. Meanwhile, ABC aired the final season of Burke's Law, starring Jean Barry. The show went through a substantial transition in this final season. The show was renamed Amos Burke, Secret Agent, and a majority of the cast was let go as Barry's millionaire detective was turned into a secret agent. This isn't the first time we've talked about a show making this very specific plot change during this period. I mean, we talked about it Monday night with the John Forsyth show. And unfortunately, I'm not sure if this really ever worked. The show was canceled at mid-season. 
After midseason, the network ran the first and only season of The Long Hot Summer. The show starred Edmund O'Brien, Roy Finnis, and Nancy Malone, and is described as a character examination set in the Deep South. The show only received a half season. Finally, CBS had the long-running mainstay of the time slot with The Danny Kaye Show. The variety show had been a staple of the lineup since 1963 and was still going strong at this point. It would remain on the air with CBS until 1967. The show is significant as an early role of Harvey Korman before he joined the cast of The Carol Burnett Show in 1967. Bringing things to a close, while Tuesday was a bit more even across the networks, CBS roared back with a vengeance on Wednesdays. Four out of the five shows the network brought that night are still well-remembered mainstays. While Gidget is the only real example of a fall show getting crushed under the weight of its competition, a large chunk of ABC's lineup on the night didn't live long enough to see 1966. Only the Big Valley and mid-season replacement Batman lived to see another season. Now, NBC wasn't hit quite as hard. However, their schedule looks completely different than the other two networks. Could they have just found their niche with a different audience? Would the Virginian audience have ever really turned in to watch the Patty Duke show? That's a tough call. We're already at Wednesday, but there's a surprising amount of TV still left to talk about. I mean, there was so much great television going on throughout the 1960s, but 1965 is proving to be a truly formidable year. How could you even decide what to watch? So come back next week as we turn our attention to Thursday, which is going to be just as dynamic. Stay tuned for more Hair Female Gaze Productions as we look at classic popular culture through a historical and feminist lens. My name is Kim. You can find me over on Twitter at kpierce624. Are you a Facebook person? Give me a like or a follow over at Kimberly C. Pierce. I also have additional classic entertainment content posting at journeysinclassicfilm.com. As always, if you like what you're seeing, please like and subscribe. Thanks, guys.